Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. I am Carolyn Perry. I'm the Senior Vice President and Dean of Faculty here at Westminster College. And I am honored to welcome you to the 11th Annual Hancock Symposium. You are here because you understand the value of a community coming together to learn together, to enjoy this time, knowing that education can transform lives and transform the world. That's why we take two days each September, we suspend our regular classes, and we call the entire community together to learn about a topic of global significance. As many of you know, we have two absolutely amazing days planned for you, and we are so glad that you're here. Well, now second, I have the honor of being the one to tell you that this is the time to silence your cell phones and any other devices you happen to have with you. Thank you for that. And now I have the honor of introducing the chair of the symposium committee, Dr. Don Holliday. But before I do that, I just have to stop, pause for a moment to give special thanks to the mastermind behind every symposium, and that is Dr. Kurt Jefferson. Dr. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Jefferson never wants to be in the limelight, but he is the one who inspires and guides and watches over this entire event from beginning to end. And he makes it better and better every single year. So again, great thanks to Dr. Jefferson for his great work. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Don Holliday is an associate professor of biology and the coordinator of our health professions program. She is known for teaching some of the most difficult and challenging courses on this campus and making them among the most beloved at the same time. She has been regularly recognized by Alpha Chi as, an, as a most inspiring faculty member. And in her short time here, she has already twice won the Parents Association Award for Teaching Excellence. Dr. Holliday has most recently stepped up to take the lead in helping us with grant writing in the sciences and science education. And she has helped create this symposium in what might be the most exhilarating two-day event that we've ever had on this campus. She is in every way an outstanding professor and colleague. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Don Holliday. Thank you. President Akande, Senior Vice President Perry, members of the board, colleagues, guests, and especially students. Good morning and welcome to the 2016 Hancock Symposium at Westminster College. For the next two days, we will immerse ourselves in an experience unlike any other. We will walk among giants and have the opportunity to learn from their research, their experiences, and their sacrifices as they explored the unexplored and questioned the unknown. The title of this year's symposium is Audacious Ingenuity. Our invited guests have shown a willingness to take surprisingly bold risks and to do so with a sense of innovation, creativity, and enterprise. Some of the greatest scientists in history were individuals whose research radically changed our viewpoints or affected the nuances of our everyday lives. For example, Jonas Salk, who used himself as a research subject in the development of his polio vaccine, and whose research institute continues his work to, quote, support those who dare to make dreams into reality. Charles Darwin, whose theory of evolution by natural selection is the backbone of biology, yet still the source of public, although not academic, controversy. Rachel Carson, who eloquently reminded us of our place in the ecosystem and started a movement that continues to inspire. And Missouri's own Edwin Hubble, who expanded our cosmological horizons and leaves us with the question, is there anybody else out there? During this symposium, we will see science as an iterative process involving questions, analysis, reanalysis, and critique. It is not just a body of knowledge. 
and memorized facts, but the application of those facts to new situations, using new technologies to answer questions that didn't even exist a few years ago, and to generate even more questions, some of which may never be answered. We will see how science evolves and old facts get replaced with a new and a hopefully better understanding of the physical world. Science involves controversy and debate. However, in the public eye, these controversies are often over-exaggerated, incorrectly focused, or seen as impediments to progress. The controversy may not reflect a disagreement among scientists, but rather a difference of social or political opinion. For example, during the second official Republican presidential candidate debate on September 16, 2015, one of the candidates shared an anecdote continuing to imply that vaccinations are linked to autism and said, without any medical training, that he was in favor of smaller vaccine doses over a longer period of time. The next day, the Washington Post reprimanded the candidates for their dangerous political rhetoric. Why? Because the original research paper published in The Lancet in 1998 by Wakefield et al. linking vaccines and autism was officially retracted in 2010, five years before this political debate. Subsequent and more robust studies have failed to show this link and instead have exposed ethical violations and scientific misconduct. This misinformation, fortunately, can lead to unnecessary illness and death in vulnerable cohorts like infants and the immunocompromised. Many of the real debates in science fail to capture the general public's attention. For example, is there a planet nine, 10 times the mass of Earth orbiting our sun every 10 to 20,000 years? Can growth differentiation factor 11 affect the number of muscle satellite cells and, in essence, turn back time? And one of my personal favorites, can low doses of bisphenol A, a synthetic endocrine disrupting chemical found in many everyday plastics, harm people and wildlife? To push science forward, you need controversy. You need a group of critical thinkers constantly challenging themselves and others, second guessing, retesting, and replicating. Sometimes this comes at great personal sacrifice. Most of the time, this comes with great passion. As you will see during this symposium, the speakers who will share their stories do so with great enthusiasm. You don't spend thousands of hours in the lab running simulations or splitting cells, in remote field locations thousands of miles away from your family, or fighting global agribusinesses if you don't have passion. One of the other main themes of this symposium that we hope to convey is one of communication. Science has become increasingly nuanced and as such necessitates interdisciplinary collaborations. The complex findings then must be articulated to the general public and the future generation of scientists. A 2015 Pew Research Center survey found adult knowledge of general science concepts in the United States to be mediocre, with only 63% of respondents able to correctly interpret a scatter plot, and only 34% realizing that water boils at a lower temperature at high altitudes. Similarly, 84% of the members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the world's largest multidisciplinary scientific society, thought that the limited knowledge Americans have about science is a major concern in scientific ingenuity, and that one of the major reasons behind this lack of understanding is too little education in the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Many of our symposium speakers are deeply committed to reversing this pattern through writing broadly consumable books asking interesting questions, such as, is God a mathematician? Through public outreach, speaking to the core of our primal sense of inquisition on popular television shows, such as Outrageous Acts of Science, to equipping STEM educators with the contemporary socio-scientific tools 
necessary for transcending the basic levels of subject matter inquiry. Over the next two days, the speakers we will hear from epitomize this journey. They push the boundaries of what we currently know to propel our understanding of ourselves and the world around us forward. To name just a few, we will hear from Dr. Sharon Deem, Director of the Institute of Conservation Medicine at the St. Louis Zoo, who works on three different continents at the intersection of animal health, human health, and ecosystem health. Dr. Francis Ali Osman, Professor of Surgery and Pathology, and the Margaret Harris and David Silverman Professor of Neuro-Oncology Research at Duke University School of Medicine, who only three months ago was appointed by President Obama to the National Cancer Advisory Board. From Dr. Mario Livio, an internationally renowned astrophysicist who for more than two decades worked with the Hubble Space Telescope. He has authored more than 400 scientific papers and appeared on numerous TV shows, including The Daily Show. Distinguished Professor of Mathematics and Science Education, Dr. Norm Lederman, who collaborates on international projects assessing inquiry-based versus direct learning in science education. Dr. Hakim Olusei, who hacks stars, studies quantum entangled particles and works on plasma-based in-space ion propulsion to open up the outer solar system to travel as part of the 100-year Starship project. His focus determines our reality. We will learn from Dr. Zachary Feinstein about Wookieeomics, his research which explored the financial repercussions and systemic risk of the destruction of the Death Stars and the death of Emperor Palpatine. Gain insight from the findings and the tenacity of Dr. Bennett Omalu in his pursuit of truth regarding the dangers and long-term issues of concussions. And we will be encouraged by Dr. Jay McDaniel to think deeply and aspire for a society where people appreciate science, reason, and progress while maintaining a respect for the Earth and its other life and remembering we are part of a family and a community. More information about these guests, the other speakers, and special events is located in your program and also in your passport. This year, the passport system is Westminster's way of tracking your attendance. At each session you attend, a student ambassador will give you a unique stamp. This stamp will be the proof of your attendance for your professors and for your chance to win attendance-based prizes. The more sessions you attend, the more you learn from these dynamic professionals and the more chances you have to win. Details are on the last page of your passport. You must have your passport with you on both days, so please keep it safe. As you may have noticed, you've already received a stamp for attending this session. And now, it is my absolute pleasure, pleasure to introduce our first speaker this morning, Dr. Tyrone Hayes. <laughs> Dr. Hayes grew up playing with frogs in the swamps of South Carolina. He completed his undergraduate degree at Harvard in organismic and evolutionary biology. He continued his work with frogs, receiving a PhD in integrative biology from UC Berkeley. Dr. Hayes is currently a full professor at Berkeley and continues his work with frogs and endocrine disrupting chemicals. The rest of his story, as one journalist put it, is the stuff of a Hollywood blockbuster. It is full of mystery, lies, shenanigans, whistleblowing, and yes, rap. So in the words of Dr. Hayes, when I see a pattern like this, I see a ruse, intentionally constructed to confuse the news. Well, I've taken it upon myself to diffuse the clues so that you can choose and to demonstrate the objectivity of the method I use. I conducted a statistical path analysis that can't be refused. Welcome to the revolution. I present Dr. Tyrone Hayes. Well, I hope I don't disappoint. 
<laughs> I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, Um, I, want to, I want to thank you for the invitation, and I'm going to tell you a story over the next 45 minutes or so that I call From Silent Spring to Silent Night, A Tale of Toads and Men. Before I tell you that story, however, I want to share with you a proverb. I won't try to pronounce it, but I learned by working in Southern Africa, loosely translated, it means people are people through other people. So I never present my work or myself without presenting to you the people who, and thanking the people who made me who I am. I always start with my family. This is an old picture. They won't let me be in the family photographs anymore um, <laughs> for their love and support. But as a, and as a biologist, they certainly have to thank my mother, my father, Romeo and Susie Hayes. I literally would not be here without them. And then I have to thank my wife, Catherine Kim, and my two children, Tyler, well, they're adults now. Tyler and Casino would not be here without her. And I show also an, another old picture, this is her prom picture, and I, and I show this for a couple reasons. Um, it demonstrates what a proud father and, and our relationship. I don't know which made me prouder, for example, that my son borrowed my tie for his prom, but that my daughter borrowed my earrings for her prom. It's just, it's just like, after 17 years of being told, no, daddy's earrings are too grown up for you, she finally got to wear my earrings. Thank her for that. I want to thank uh, all of the funders, and also this is my disclosure, as, as you may have picked up on. I have had some interactions with the uh, chemical manufacturers, uh, Novartis and Syngenta, and, and well, then they got me started, as you'll see. I want to thank all the students that have been involved. Uh, this is, these are former lab members, these are more recent lab members, and everybody in blue on both of these slides was an undergraduate. I had a wonderful experience as an undergraduate myself, and I, for the last 20-something years, have been trying to give that back where I can. And this is my current laboratory. Um, we celebrate a great deal of diversity. There was one guy in the lab at this time, but he didn't show up for the photograph. And finally, I want to acknowledge and, and, and thank and pay tribute to my grandmother, who, who passed away in 2005, uh, for a couple of things. One is I was lucky enough that before she passed on, herself, she passed on her love of education and her desire to make the world a better place through education. She also taught me something very important, that if you want to get a point across, if you want people to listen, if you want people to learn, don't preach, don't teach, don't give talks, just tell a good story. And so I, that's what I want to do today. I just want to tell you a good story. And that story will start and end with a little boy who likes frogs. This is a book that my mom sent me when my son was born, and she wrote a note in there that said, this was your dad's favorite book. And I admit to people, always, I don't remember the book. But my mama don't lie. She says it was my favorite book. It was my favorite book. What I do remember is that I've been trying to answer this question, what is a frog, for as long as I can remember, I've been in love with frogs. And a lot of that love, I also contribute to my grandmother. This is where she lives. I don't know if you can see the, the house there. It's a, her grandfather built that house. My grandmother was born in that house. My mother was born in that house. And I give you an idea of how much history, how much of me was in that house. When my grandmother passed away, the bill of sale for her grandmother, who was born a slave, was still in that house. I played in that, at that house every weekend as a child. And I remember as a child, there was a huge forest behind her house. And that was where I fell in love with frogs and lizards and and now compliments of Google Earth, I can share with you where I had that experience. It was a tiny, tiny little strip of woods. The cemetery was always there, the highway was always there, there's my grandmother's house. But my memory was that it was like the Amazon, it was huge. I remember getting lost in there for hours. And it was there that I discovered these guys. An interesting thing you might not know about amphibians that's illustrated here is, is they're quite altruistic. You, you see the frog on the top has hurt its leg and the one on the bottom is nice enough to give it a ride home. That's just probably something you didn't know about frogs. And I would tell a joke, but I don't think I could give you the punchline that ends something like, see what happens when you help a friend. Because be before they actually get home, they lay these eggs. Right? And so what you're looking at is this huge communal clump of eggs. And the eggs in the middle, what interests me, is that the eggs in the middle, I don't know if you can see the pointer there, are, can be warmer than the eggs on the outside. That means that the frogs that lay their eggs in the middle their offspring are going to grow faster, develop faster, and maybe that temperature could even determine whether or not they become male or female. So I tried to study whether or not this was the case. 
This is, you're going to see a lot of gonads in this talk. Right? I don't know if you're used to that, but you will. So these are testes and these are ovaries. So I did these studies to look at the effect of temperature on sex determination in amphibians. And then I also was interested in the interaction between genes and the environment. So I tried to look for sex chromosomes to see what kind of boundaries the genes could put on whether or not the temperature could affect sex. Now, I will periodically, periodically stop and tell you where we're at in our story. Right now, we're at my freshman year at Harvard, and this is work that became my senior honors thesis. This is why the slide looks this way, because there was no Adobe Photoshop back then, young people. This was back when cut and paste literally meant cut and paste. You had to cut it out and paste it on the page. That's where that function comes from, and all of the software you use, that's where that name comes from. And here I am, other than my wife, one of the two people I have to thank. I think without this man, I would not have finished college. He took me in. He took me into the field. Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. There I was in the swamp. I think Laura, another undergraduate, she probably went on to do something else because she wasn't quite as excited as I was <laughs> to be covered in mud in the swamp at 6 a.m. on a Sunday. But it was almost like a dream come true for me. That dream became even truer when I became a graduate student. Because you see, when I was a kid, I dreamed of going to Africa. I remember folding out the pages in National Geographic magazine and dreaming of this, this like fantastic magical place. And it was completely a dream. My, my family income when I went to college was $9,000 a year. First time I ever went on an airplane was when I went to college. But in graduate school, uh oh, it says it's looking for some server or something. graduate school, I got the opportunity, or just after I finished graduate school, to go to Africa. I got to have that weird beard, but National Geographic paid for it. So I literally became that guy that I saw on TV. I literally had my dream come true. I got to be on a TV show. I got to be on a Toyota commercial. Look it up. But significantly, I also got to work in this area, an area called the Arabuku Sukoke. And that's one of the cool things about working in Africa. Africa. You get the same words like Arabuku Sukoke. You don't get that opportunity anywhere else. And while working in the Arabuku Sukoke, I discovered this little frog where the males and females are differently colored. And that's the kind of thing that little boys who like frogs, you just go nuts when you find something like this. This was just like, wow. And so I did some experiments where I hypothesized that the color difference was estrogen dependent because when you raise them up they all start out green and the females change color at sexual maturity so this is the same frog photographed once a day for six days and by the way now we had adobe photoshop so now you can see how clean and nice it looks and so the females when they reach puberty change color and so the same way that when female humans reach puberty estrogen causes your breast to grow and you'll see why i use that analogy we hypothesize that estrogen causes color change and so we did these really simple experiments where we just dipped them in hormone the male hormone testosterone didn't do anything but estrogen caused them to change color whether or not they were male or female that was pretty exciting well then on february 16th 23 years ago, almost 24 years ago, I remember the date because it's the day before my son was born. And I was at UC Davis talking about my color changing frog. My wife went into labor. We're driving back down the highway to get to the hospital. And my wife says, you should patent that frog. And I thought, oh, it's the crazy pregnancy hormones or something. You can't patent a frog. But it turns out you can patent a frog. We called it the Hyperolis argus. That's the species. Endocrine screen or the Hastes. <laughs> and here's why you patent a frog. And I just wanted to do it because it was cool. It's the kind of thing that little boys who like frogs just think of cool, right? But here's why you patent a frog. As I told you, the controls, the unexposed ones, all start out green. If you give them estradiol, that's the natural estrogen. doesn't matter if you're a frog, a dog, a cat, a hog, or a human. If you're an adult female, this hormone circulates in your blood, causes my frog to change color. If you give them ethanol estradiol, this is the synthetic estrogen that's used in birth control pill. They'll change color. And, and literally, we're just dipping the frogs in this hormone, right? If you give them DES, a very potent pharmaceutical estrogen, they'll change color. If you give them DDT, an insecticide that happens to mimic estrogen, they'll change color. So we screened like dozens of compounds, and we found out that every estrogen that caused my frog to change color, and I could call it my frog because I patented it, that every estrogen that caused my frog to change color was also known to promote breast cancer. 
the number one cancer in women. So we had a little frog that we can dip in solution and figure out which chemicals might lead or promote breast cancer. In fact, we could, you could send me a sample of your water. I could dip the frog in there. If they change color, I'd be like, well, you might not want to drink that water. We wouldn't even have to know what the chemical was. What's more is we showed that if we treat these frogs with tamoxifen, we could block the effects of estrogen. And at the time, tamoxifen was the estrogen blocker used to treat breast cancer. So we could not only figure out compounds that might promote breast cancer, we could use this little frog as a preliminary screen to find compounds that might block breast cancer. Well, then the little boy who likes frogs gets introduced to some grown-up words. And I think grown-up words always come in two, don't you? Anytime you hear something, you need two words to describe it. I call it a grown-up word. In this case, the word was intellectual property. <laughs> See, I'm just a little boy who likes frogs, and I patent this frog, and in a university says, that's a great idea, but it belongs to us. All your ideas belong to us. And if you don't show us how you're going to make money on it, then we're going to sell it. So my wife has an MBA and an MPH. We think, okay, yeah, we'll start a little mom and pop shop. And then we meet this little company called Novartis. I'm being obnoxious, the largest chemical company in the world. And they said, we want you to use frogs to tell us if atrazine is an endocrine disruptor in any way. That's atrazine, that's chlorotriazine. If you live in Missouri, you're very familiar with atrazine. You may not know it, but you had it for breakfast this morning, I can assure you. It's an herbicide or weed killer. It's mostly used on corn in this country. It's been used since 1958. And we use 80 million pounds annually in the United States now. It's the number two selling agrochemical. It's used in more than 80 countries, but now it's outlawed in all of Europe. And now let me give you a disclaimer. This slide is a lie. According to the company lawyer, it has not been outlawed in all of Europe. It has been denied regulatory approval by the European Union. I'm not sure what the difference is. But I know that this slide pisses them off, so that's the one that I use because that's just the kind of brother I am. <laughs> but the other point is, here we have a company that's based in Europe, but chemicals not allowed, and we're using 80 million pounds. I think it should tell you something. So we decided to use the African clawed frog, another African frog, to do these studies because everybody uses Xenopus. You, you guys ever hear this frog? You know about it? I'm going to tell you why everybody uses it, though. It's like the lab rat of the amphibian world. Everybody uses this frog because in 1920, somebody discovered that if you inject this frog with the pregnancy hormone, the human pregnancy hormone, HCG, this frog will lay eggs. So by 1940, this frog was the pregnancy test. If you thought you were pregnant, you would go to the doctor and they would inject some urine into the frog and if the frog laid eggs, you'd be either happy or sad, depending on your situation. Now, I tell you this story for three reasons. One is, it shows you the value of curiosity-based research, right? Like, who's the first guy who thought, hmm, I wonder what will happen if I inject pee into a frog? <laughs> I just, you know, who, who comes up with that? But the second reason I tell you is it shows you the similarity between our hormones, the hormone that's responsible for you being here, and frog hormones, just like in my color-changing frog. The estrogens that are important to you are also important to this frog. So as I tell you what atrazine does to the hormones in this frog, you should be thinking, what might it do to me if our hormones are so similar? And that's what we'll end up. That's why I call it a tale of toads and men. Uh, third, what, was the third, what was the third reason? Oh, the third reason is, historically, after people discovered other means of detecting pregnancy, they threw these frogs out. So I actually can go get these African clawed frogs in San Diego now and not have to pay for them from the store. So I guess technically mine are African-American clawed frogs, but that's a... That's a point that's not really relevant to the story. Atrazine, we found, inhibited growth of the voice box of the larynx in males. And that's bad news because male frogs sing and females don't for the same reason men have deeper voices than women. Testosterone. So we went to the gonads. I told you, you're going to see a lot of gonads today. And these aren't normal looking gonads, though. These are, these are testes. This is an animal that's been exposed to atrazine. So it's a male. But oh, wait, then there's ovaries. Then there's a large testis. Then there's more. This frog could hurt its leg and give itself a ride home. That's and this is not normal. And when I say not normal, I don't. It, it's not a judgment thing. I'm thinking that there are no frogs that are naturally hermaphroditic. There are fish that are naturally hermaphroditic, but this is not a normal way for frogs to develop. So we develop a hypothesis. See, that's what you do in science. You develop a hypothesis. And our hypothesis was that normally testosterone should come out of the testis and make you know the voice box grow. Testosterone is, you guys know the word portmanteau? It's one of my favorite words. I don't even know if I pronounce it right. It means when you stick two words together, like smoke and fog, you get smog. 
twist and jerk to get twerk. Uh, testosterone is a portmanteau. It means testicular hormone. It's two words stuck together. So it is the male hormone, testicular hormone. So we hypothesized that what atrazine does is it turns on the enzyme aromatase. I want you to remember aromatase. It's the machinery that converts testosterone into estrogen. Estrogen means the generator of estrus. It's the female hormone. So our hypothesis was that if you're exposed to atrazine, your testosterone is being used up, so you're demasculinized, and you're subsequently feminized because now you're making the female hormone, which is okay if you're a female, maybe not so much if you're a male. And so we tested this hypothesis. Control males had testosterone levels that looked like this. Atrazine-treated males were reduced so that they weren't different from females. Now let me tell you where we're at in my story. We published this paper. I call it hermaphroditic demasculized frogs after exposure to the herbicide atrazine at low ecologically relevant doses. And not only did we publish it, but we published it in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS. It's a big deal, because I'm coming up for tenure. I call my mom. I'm like, mom, I have a paper coming out in PNAS. Silence. My mom says, I said, mom, I have a paper. She says, yeah, I heard you. I just don't understand how you have a paper cut on your penis. And I was like, no. I said, PNAS. This is 100% true story. My mom calls me back the next week, and she says, son, how important is that paper you're talking about? I said, pretty important. She said, because I went to Barnes & Noble, and they never heard of that magazine. <laughs> and, I, and, and so you just heard in the introduction from, from Dawn about you know, some of the ways that the public is lacking access to science. This is going to become very important in, in, when my story is. My most important publication now is a kid's book that I didn't even write, but my mom can get it in Barnes & Noble, and I'll tell you why that's so important. Uh, by the way, this PNAS paper also had four black men and a Latina as co-authors, which is probably a record for the National Academy, something else that I'm very proud of. As important as it was, it didn't answer two questions, though. It didn't answer whether or not these hermaphrodites were males with ovaries or females with testes. Seems like an easy question to answer, except as I learned in college, frogs don't have sex chromosomes. All that cut and pasting I showed you. Frogs don't have sex chromosomes. So we didn't know at the time whether we couldn't answer the question. We had a good idea, because if you treat frogs with atrazine, maybe you might get 50% female, 30% male, and 20% hermaphrodite. So we had a good idea it was the males that were being affected. We also didn't know what happens when they become adults. Sounds like an easy question to answer, except, you know, these frogs take about four years to grow up. That means I got to get an undergraduate and say, hey, 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 I have a project for you. And maybe by the time you graduate, we might have an answer. In fact, it was worse than that. It took like eight years, but we finally got that. See, they hurt their legs all the time. But by the time the paper came out, you know what they're doing, right? I had a student who after four years go, they're not really having a hurt leg? I'm like, no. <laughs> kind of lost for a long Like, where do you think all those eggs came from after the riot? So it turns out by the time the paper came out, there was a gene that had been discovered called DMW that only females have. So we ran some PCR, and we could identify that the guy on top, who kind of looks like he's smiling at future magic, that's his brother. He's also a male. It turns out about 10% of the animals in this experiment completely turned into females. They lay eggs and everything. So this, he now is a, is a great grandmother. Mm, that, so now, I could have published, males turning into females, I could have published that. But you know what? I had tenure. I was in no hurry. The next thing I wanted to know is, I wanted to know what happens to the males that don't turn into females. Can they copulate properly? Well, that's an easy enough question to answer, except that frogs breed in the spring, and, and, and apparently so do undergraduates. So I got to try to get them to stay home for spring break and not worry about some pool party or something like that. So I devised a plan in 2008. I said, look, I'll throw a pool party if you stay here and work. And we'll get a PDF paper out of it. How many of you guys are undergrads? How many of you guys would do that? I mean, Snoop Dogg won't be there, but you'd you do that. OK. It kind of went something like this. This is 100% true story. This is our apparatus. And what we did was we put four females in there, four control males and four atrazine-treated males, and we just asked, can you compete, if you're exposed to atrazine, can you compete for females? Real simple, right? Guys are thinking, this isn't the sex ratio you wanted to club, right? But the idea is the females had to be limited. So we put the frogs in there. We put them in there at, you know, 7 p.m. Lights go out, Marvin Gaye comes on. And then you come back in the next morning and we put stitches in them so we can tell who's doing it. And you come back and you just count which males were successful and which males weren't, weren't successful. And we did this experiment four times. 
We did it five times, but one morning one of the students kicked the pool so we couldn't, couldn't get the data. But we found out that the atrophy treated males almost never win. Almost never. And then, because I'm an endocrinologist, we had to measure some hormones, and we found out that the reason they almost never win is that they don't have enough testosterone. So the controls on average have more testosterone. And if you look at the individuals who make love connection, these guys that are treated with atrazine are kind of below the testosterone threshold. If either the females don't like them, or the, or the other males with high testosterone beat them up and exclude them, but they, they can't cut them. Now, I probably could have published that, except I had tenure. I was in no hurry. So next, I wanted to know, what if there was no competition? What if you had the female, could you perform? So we did, did what I call the Motel 6 experiments. In this case, we just got them in a room, we left them together, no competition, one male, one female, and then we collected the eggs, and then we just counted how many were unhatched, like this one, versus how many hatched after two days. Complicated technology, right? Yeah, there's an undergrad sitting in the room going, one, two, three. But fruitful, because if you do that, you found out that, that control males fertilize about 85% of the eggs, atrazine treated males like 15%. One, because they don't even try, they don't have enough testosterone to show the masculine behavior. But two, because it, but if you look at the testis, the control and atrazine look very different. If I blow this up, control testis, testicular tubules are full of sperm. See all those soldiers ready to go. The atrazine treated animals, though, have cellular debris in their testis. They don't have enough testosterone to make the sperm. So even if they copulate with a the female, they have very low fertility. So we published another paper in PNAS again called Atrazine Induces Complete Feminization and Chemical Castration in Male and African Clawed Frogs. Chemical Castration. You know it's growing up word. Because it comes in two. The company hates that word. That's why I put it in the title. Because that's just the kind of brother I am. The other thing that's important about this paper, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight undergraduates co-authored this paper. Every one of them now has either an MD or a PhD. I'm very proud of that. Thank you. We weren't done yet, though. I still got to come up for full professor, not just joking. We wanted to know if there were effects in other species of frogs. So we treated North American leopard frogs, and we found that they didn't become hermaphrodites, but they grew eggs in their testes. So I told you you're going to see a lot of gonads. So you see those in testes, and then you see those big lumps, what I call the junk in the trunk. Those are all eggs that are bursting through the surface of their testes. Now, at this point, I'm involved with the Environmental Protection Agency, and I write to Protection Agency, I say, look at this. In fact, I broke, not, not curfew, what's it called? Um, uh, what's it called when you can't talk about something before it's published? Embargo, that's what I did. So I broke embargo, because this was being published in Nature, another one of those magazines that my mom can't get in Nature. And, and I remember the EPA wrote me back, and they said, thank you, Dr. Hayes, that's a very interesting finding. However, it is not one that would trigger reassessment of the chemical atrazine. It is not an adverse effect. Now, my wife tells me that there is nothing more painful in life than childbirth. And since I'll never experience that, I gotta give her that. But I would guess, wouldn't the rest of the men in this room, I would guess that a dozen chicken eggs in my testicle to be in the top five. <laughs> Don't you think? The EPA, the EPA says, though, it's not an adverse effect. Okay. So the next question we asked, tell the frogs that, the next question we asked was, do we, these effects occur in the wild? Because maybe it's just a laboratory artifact. Now, to give you an idea, we get these effects at 0.1 parts per billion. That's like one one thousandth of a grain of salt in two liters. That's like nothing. The package of atrazine recommends usage of 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. So a typical farmer might be using this stuff at levels that are 290 million times higher than we're using in the lab. If you look in the literature, you'll find that this is minimum and maximum in agriculture runoff, temperate pools, permanent water, and precipitation. Here's what we're using in the lab. Here are all the areas that would be at risk, that are at risk. And here's what's allowed in your drinking water. 30 times what we know to be biologically effective. In fact, environmental health and safety, and I, I'm sure you have the same thing in your college. They, they wrote me a letter and said, well, we're concerned about your experiments. What are you gonna do with the wastewater after you treat the frogs? I said, well, I'm gonna take it home and drink it. Because it's guaranteed they have less than See, I thought that was funny too, but not the EHNS people. Look at that. There's enough atrazine in rainwater to chemically castrate feminized frogs. A half 
million pounds of atrazine come down in rainwater in the U.S. every year. It can travel over a thousand kilometers, that's 600 miles for Americans. So we went into the field and we collected some frogs and here's my, I think this might be the last gonads you're going to see. And I'm going to slice this up for you because the, the test is normal, but if you slice them up and I'm folding out a section, this stain is different, the color is different because of the stain we use under the microscope. And what I'm highlighting here now are eggs in the testes. We call them testicular oocytes, grown up word, testicular oocytes. The company got mad, they got so mad that they wrote a letter to nature and, and they tried to get they tried to get the work retracted because I made up a word. Aren't all words made up before they're words? <laughs> Plus, I'm at the heart, but I can make up a word if I want to. <laughs> so, here's what we did. And now it's in the literature. Everybody got to call them testiculocytes now. <laughs> yeah, right. So, look, if you look at this map, the red here is where most of the atrazine use, is used. And it goes down to the gray-white. And, and so we did this study where we control for latitude and, and we went out and measured frogs and atrazine. And I'm just being obnoxious, we didn't control for latitude, but if you follow this path, this is Highway I-80 and we were going to a conference in Indiana and we collected the frogs and water along the way and got a nature paper. See, that's fuel efficiency, my friends. And, and so what we found out was that every place we found atrazine, we found hermaphroditic frogs. Um, but it got published in Nature, not just because of that correlation, it's because we also were able to take frogs from a spot with atrazine, raise them in clean water, and they weren't hermaphrodites, and take ones from atrazine contaminated areas as eggs and raise them in, wait, did I say that backwards? We could take ones from clean areas and raise them in atrazine and make them hermaphrodites, and we could take ones from atrazine treated areas and raise them and they would come out normal. So it wasn't just a correlation, we could, we could demonstrate cause and effect. Well, now I'll take you back to Africa again. And that got published in Nature, by the way, and I became a full professor and the company got mad. Um, I'm going to take you back to Africa now, to Lake Nabugabo in Uganda, because I think this slide illustrates something excellent. What it shows is that the runoff from this crop, which I believe is arrowroot, being collected here is the sole source of drinking, cooking, bathing water for this village in, in Uganda, Nabugabo. Here. That means that environmental health and public health aren't just similar, they're one. If I tell the people in this village that the frogs in that water have low immune function and are growing eggs in their testes, and that's the same water you drink, they see that connection immediately, whereas in my village, maybe like in yours, my water's just here, comes from here, but I don't have that connection. It just comes out of a faucet, and we make these assumptions that this environmental protection agency, that somebody is keeping it clean for us. And I'm here to tell you that's not the case. I call this from Silent Spring to Silent Night. And, and you just heard mention of Rachel Carson, because in much the same way that Rachel Carson taught that the death of birds, primarily due to pesticides, and our silent spring was a warning to us, I firmly believe that the loss of amphibian diversity, 70% of the world's amphibians, are in decline. This is a group of animals that survived the mass extinction that took out the dinosaurs, and 70% are in decline. I believe that our pending silent night is a warning for us, in much the way Rachel Carson taught about the loss of birds. To illustrate that, a colleague of mine wrote, in ecoepidemiology, the occurrence of an association of more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. Well, I haven't talked to you about just correlation. I've talked about controlled experiments that involve not just more than one population, but more than one species, more than one genera, more than one family of frogs. But what's more is, there's evidence that atrazine does similar things across vertebrate classes, including fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And if you know your phylogenetics, you know there are only two groups missing. So basically, in every vertebrate class that's been examined. I wrote a paper after the company accused me of being the only person to show that there was adverse effects of atrazine. I wrote a paper called Demasculinization and Feminization of Male Gonads by Atrazine Consistent Effects Across Vertebrate Classes. And I elicited 22 co authors from 12 different countries. And what we showed was that the effects are occurring across vertebrate classes. In fact, in this paper, I coined the word gonadotoxin. The lawyer wrote another letter. So I can't make up words. You know, I read somewhere that all language, like all of you Homo sapiens, originated in Africa. All language. So I'm just building my people through that anyway. I don't know why they are. So here's what we showed. Remember my frog, sperm and a testis given atrazine, no sperm. This is a guy in Belgium, fish, sperm and a testis given atrazine, no sperm. This is a couple in Argentina with a reptile, a K 
caiman. It's like a big alligator. Sperm in the testis. Give it atrazine. No sperm. This is a rat. This work was done in Croatia and in Nigeria. Sperm in a testicular tubule. Give it atrazine. No sperm. And this is a guy in Pakistan. I didn't know any of these guys before this. Now I've gotten to go to all these countries to meet them. Sperm in the testis with a bird, quail, give it atrazine, no sperm. So it wasn't just frogs, and it wasn't just me. And the idea that testosterone decline due to atrazine was causing the sperm to go down? This is a guy in England who showed that in fish. This is in salmon, testosterone decreases. This is my work in frogs. This is the company's own work in rats. So it's not just frogs. Frogs make estrogen the same way humans do, the same way birds and reptiles. So you see the same types of effects. And humans, Shauna Swan showed that, where did she do this work? Oh, Columbia, Missouri. That if you're a male that's exposed to atrazine, that if you have a 0.1 parts per billion atrazine in your urine, you have a low sperm count, and you have trouble getting your wife pregnant. Now, that's just a correlation, but imagine that. If these guys have enough sperm, enough atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate a frog or a fish, they have low sperm count, and they can't get their wives pregnant. Let's leave Columbia, Missouri, because here's another study in California. To, and, I, and you see what I did? I, I'm a fool with PowerPoint. I squashed the data down because I changed the y-axis. Because here are the levels of field workers, atrazine, in California. And I'll squash that down again. Because here are the levels of men who apply atrazine, 2,400 parts per billion. Men who apply atrazine have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine than we use to chemically castrate frogs and fish. 24,000 times. One of these guys could pee in a bucket, and I could use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. Now a little boy who likes frogs gets introduced to another grown-up word, environmental justice and environmental racism. Because see, the men who are being exposed, 90% of them in California are Latino. Does atrazine induce aromatase like it does in frogs? And you're not going to develop yoked up eggs, that's what those words mean, in your testis if you're a human, but it certainly happens if you're a frog. And here are my colleagues who publish with me. It happens in fish and it happens in reptiles, testicular oocytes. In fact, the fish work was done right over in Columbia, Missouri at the USGS labs, independent of my work. If you're a human, you're worried about aromatase because aromatase is involved in mammary cancer and prostate cancer. With regards to prostate cancer, the company showed in their factory in San Gabriel, Louisiana, a community that's 80% African American, 80% black, they showed that their factory workers have an 8.4 fold increase in prostate cancer. Now it's just a correlation, but as I'll show you later, similar things have been shown in rats. In humans, there's one study in Kentucky with very low p-value that shows that women whose well water contaminate with atrazine are more likely to develop breast cancer. It's just a correlation. But if you look at rats, and this is the company's work, there's a decline in testosterone and a concomitant increase in estrogen, just like we've seen in fish, just like we've seen in birds, just like we've seen in reptiles, just like we've seen in amphibians. These are mammals now like us. But they also showed that in rats that expose to atrazine, that there's an increased incidence of mammary tumors, and those tumors are estrogen dependent. In humans, if you take human cell lines that don't normally produce estrogen, and give them atrazine, what you find out is that there's the control of background level, but once you give them atrazine, they start expressing aromatase and making estrogen. Just like we've shown in fish, just like we've shown in amphibians, just like we've shown in reptiles, just like we've shown in birds, just like we've shown in lab rats, why would you expect human cells to respond any differently? And we've published on this as well. Now the company changed, they became Syngenta, which I think still should be spelled with an I, but they don't listen to me. Um, I went down to visit them. They have a pipe that runs, and by the way, they stopped paying me a long time ago. <laughs> they have a pipe that runs straight into the Gulf of Mexico through the Mississippi River. 1.2 million pounds of atrazine flow into the Gulf of Mexico every year through a community that looks much like this, that as I said, is 80% African American. I mentioned the 80% African American because if you look at the top 13 cancers that you're going to die from in the U.S., if you're black, you're more likely to die from 11, more likely to get 11 of the 13. If you're black, relative to whites, you're more likely to die from 13 out of 13 cancers. Is that a biological difference, or is that because if you're a minority, you're more likely to live in and more likely to work in areas where you're exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with 
adverse health outcomes. My colleagues who study cancer say that less than 30% of cancer is genetic. That means that when the doctor tells you you're more likely to get breast cancer, for example, if your mother, your aunt, or your sister, they're not telling you this genetics. They're telling you that you've been exposed to the same crap as the rest of your family. And I'm all down for coma for the cure, but how about coma for the cause? Because most cell lines that we use, with the exception of HeLa, don't come from minorities. The breast cancer cell lines, for example, even if you find the cure using those cell lines, that cure may be relevant to the people who are more likely to get and more likely to die from the cancer that you're studying. I'll come back to this cartoon a second time. What's more, a graduate student of mine showed that if you give breast cancer cells atrazine, they start expressing aromatase, like we've shown in everything else. That's important because when you get breast cancer, it's typically after menopause, and it's typically when estrogen levels are lower than they've ever been in your life. But the breast cancers themselves, the fibroblasts, the cells around the cancer, express aromatase, it turns out. And so they make their own estrogen locally, and that estrogen fuels the damaged cells promoting those tumors. In fact, the local expression of aromatase is so important that the number one treatment for breast cancer is a chemical called letrozole, which reduces aromatase and estrogen so that your damaged cells don't spread, turn into tumors. Does that make any sense when the number one contaminant of drinking water does exactly the opposite? It turns on aromatase, increases the estrogen, and promotes breast cancer in rats? Well, it turns out it made sense to Novartis and oncology because they offer treatments for cancers that range from breast cancer. That's right. So the year 2000, the company that gave us the number one contaminant, atrazine, which turns on aromatase, was also making an aromatase blocker to sell breast cancer. So while you were living in the Midwest taking letrozole to treat your breast cancer, it was having to fight it out with the chemical made by the same company that does exactly the opposite. I published a paper called The One-Stop Shop Chemical Causes and Cures for Breast Cancer. <laughs> the company didn't like that so much. <laughs> That's why I called it that. again. So what's happened is, to summarize, I think my interest in this aquatic organism is talking quite a bit about this aquatic organism. Because we use the same hormones when we're developing. We develop in water, just like frogs do in the amniotic fluid. Those chemicals can cross the placenta, and the exact same chemical hormones made the exact same way. Testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, thyroid hormone, are important for both frog development and human development. I would argue that one of my frogs, that a human fetus trapped in a contaminated amniotic fluid is no different than one of my frogs trapped in a pond or aquarium filled with synthetic chemicals. We are exposed, by some estimates, to over 200 synthetic chemicals before we leave the womb. Atrazine and other people's studies, and I'm gonna brag about stuff that I didn't do now, Rats, which we use as a proxy for us, atrazine has been shown to cause prostate and mammary cancer, immune failure, which we also publish in children frogs. Atrazine causes neural damage when rats are exposed in utero. And what I'm going to show you now is a series of studies that completely changed how I view my role in this world. Atrazine causes abortion. When rats are fed atrazine, it causes a hormone imbalance, and this work was published by the EPA labs. Of those rats that don't abort, the sons are born with prostate disease. They're born with the prostate of an old man. Of those rats that don't abort, the daughters are born with impaired mammary development, such that when those rats grow up, their offspring have retarded growth and development because they can't make enough milk to support their offspring. And this series of studies affected me more than anything I've done in my own research. Because you see the rat on the bottom, rat on the bottom? A rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So that when I think about my little girl, she's 20 years old now, she's in college just like you all. When I think about the fact that chemicals that we're using today could impact my daughter's grandchildren. When I 
think about the fact that chemicals that we're using today and that they could affect your grandchildren it moves me in a very different way than just a little boy who likes frogs a colleague of mine shown that if you get pregnant during peak atrazine contamination shown in the dark down to the bottom you're more likely to have birth defects it's just correlation some of those studies include you're more like it, and I apologize for the images, but a picture's worth a thousand words. This study showed that agriculture-related chemical exposure, and this isn't my work, season of concept, conception and risk of gastrothesis in Washington State. The maternal exposure they found to surface water atrazine is associated with fetal gastrothesis. I didn't know what fetal gastrothesis is. It's where the baby's born with the intestine outside of the body. Another study showed that maternal residential atrazine exposure and the risk for coenal atresia, and I won't read you all of this, I know what coenal atresia was, but it's when the oral and nasal cavity don't close up. And interesting to me, here's a study, a case control study of maternal residential atrazine and male genital malformations. They showed that if you're exposed to atrazine and you're carrying a son, you're more likely to have hypospadias, that son, when it's born, but the urethra doesn't end through the penis. You're more likely to have cryptorchidism, where the testicles don't descend into the scrotum. You're more likely to have a baby that has micropenis, where the penis doesn't grow. And it's interesting to me because the male genitals depend on testosterone. And you can get these malformations if the mother is exposed to too much estrogen during pregnancy. And when you're exposed to a chemical, atrazine, that reduces testosterone and increases estrogen, you have a son that looks like it didn't have enough testosterone and too much estrogen. It's just correlation. But it's my grandchildren. Do I want to take that risk for a chemical that only increases corn yield by 1.2%? I think it's time that we stop using, I use this guy because he doesn't like me. He works for the manufacturer. But it's time we stop using an adult white male to decide whether or not a chemical is toxic when we know that a little bit of toxin can cross the placenta and have much bigger effects than it would have on an adult. We know that some of these toxins, including atrazine, can come across in breast milk. And we know that a little bit of toxin in a little one, in an adult, is a lot of toxin. And we're not the only ones who know it. You know who else knows it? The EPA. The EPA said in an article about atrazine in the New Yorker magazine, they said, quote, a monetary value is assigned to disease, impairments, and shortened lives, and weight against the benefits of keeping the chemical in use. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, said a mon... Does the E stand for environmental or economic protection? I don't know. They say a monetary value is assigned to disease. So they're not saying atrazine doesn't do anything. They say, yeah, we know it does stuff. But somebody has to pay the price. And even though we live in a country where we say all persons are created equal and should feel that way, we know that they're not treated equally once they're here. And now we know because these chemicals cross the placenta, they're not treated equally even before they're here. This is a map of California. And for those of you who don't know, a few facts about California. We're the fifth largest economy in the world because of agriculture. One in 10 jobs are in ag, 30% of the land is in ag. We produce 350 agricultural products. And people get upset when I say this in the Midwest, but we feed the United States. 50% of the U.S.'s food comes from California. The corn we grow here, we eat less than 2% of that corn. We use more pesticides than any other state, and 90% of the workers are Hispanic. And now if you look at the counties, top 10 counties for agriculture, these are the counties that make us the fifth richest country in the world. What do you think the three poorest towns are in California? Environmental racism, environmental justice, the people who make us the fifth largest economy in the world are the targets of chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. And so this business that Syngenta set over Columbia, Missouri, uh, the University of Missouri, and this business on their website about feeding the world, here's a map of where all the corn grows. Take a quick look. What's missing from this graph? so little food it doesn't even show up. We use so little of the corn as food that it doesn't even show up. Less than 2%. Most of it now goes to ethanol. So we're using a chemical that we know has these adverse health outcomes. Well, not for food, not to feed the world, not when 20% of the world dies of starvation. No, that's just not true. The other problem is over 70%, some say 90% of the seeds we own, those are the companies in blue, are owned by six chemical companies. So my issue with GMO is not a direct health impairment. My issue with GMO is that 90% of the corn and soy, 90% of the crops now that we grow, are using GMO 
to make herbicide resistant so that we can use more. And when you have a company whose job it is to make money on chemicals, owning up to 90% of the seed, I think that creates a problem. I think it creates a problem when, I love Obama, voted for him twice, not in the same election, but he appointed that former head of Monsanto the, over the FDA, and that's rampant throughout the EPA as well. I think that's a problem. My advisor told me, don't be an advocate, let the science speak for itself. And I used to believe that, and then some say I have to walk across the stage when I tell you that I crossed the line. And in crossing the line, as you heard in my introduction, there were some consequences. Sometimes articles like this come out when I'm going to a place to speak. Sometimes they publish things on the web like this. I'm not going to read it, I'll let you read it. Because there was a few email exchanges, and you know. I use the language that I, hey, how many people can search their professor and get that as a keyword? I used a few phrases that I learned back when I grew up. <laughs> but the reason, the reason it started was because of the company. They, they've made some very personal attacks on me, and I wasn't able to talk about this, except the company lost a lawsuit, and the New Yorker got a hold of their private handwritten notes that show the kind of stuff that I went through, the kind of attacks, because I spoke out about not just my science, but the science in total. Syngenta wrote the New Yorker magazine, I am troubled by a suggestion that we have ever tried to discredit anyone. Our focus has always been on communicating the science and setting the record straight. Where would I get that from? Well, it turns out she's troubled, she says, by suggesting they've ever tried to discredit anyone. So it turns out all of these court documents with their handwritten out, dozens of pages of meetings about me, which I suspected anyway, here's what one of their notes said. Look at their strategy under science. What's the first thing under that? <laughs> discredit Hayes. Because she's trouble at the notion that they ever tried to discredit anyone. Here's some of the other things we found in our notes. So I'm reading you what Syngenta wrote about me. They said it was, they wanted to know the science, but they wrote, if TH wanted to win the day, he'd have the goods. If TH involved in scandal, environmental groups will drop him. Don't disrespect him. At least they got that part right. But what's more is they went into this whole thing. Here's a list. And part, can I, can I say shit? Here's a list of shit they were going to do to me. They wrote it down. Have his work audited, FOIA raw data, uh, investigate students, they scratch that out. Family background, investigate his wife, consider suing, and here's my favorite. Here's my favorite, I don't, I don't know if you can read that. Can you read that? Set a trap, set a trap. Somebody sat in a room and wrote down, set a trap. They wrote down they were gonna blog my psychology. My psychological profile, they paid somebody $10,000 to try to figure out if I was crazy or not. Three things I gotta say about that. One is, you ain't got to pay nobody $10,000 to find out if Tyrone crazy. You could just ask anybody who know. And they'll say, oh yeah, that brother crazy. That don't mean that my work ain't good. Outcome. Either they're going to come back and say, oh yeah, he's crazy, and he's kicking your butt. <laughs> or they're going to come back and say, no, he ain't crazy, you just pissed off a black man. And some of y'all get the two things confused. You don't know that many of us, we're emotional people. The third thing I would ask is, who's crazy? Somebody sat in a room and wrote down, set a trap. <laughs> Even I know that the first page of the evil spy handbook is you don't write your plan down. If you do, you eat it and burn it and self-destruct it. You don't turn it into a judge and write, Confidential, do not share on it. Set a trap. I might be crazy, but I ain't stupid. That's a special kind of stupid. This part's not so funny. The EPA wrote, it is unfortunate but not uncommon for registrants to sit on data that may be considered adverse to the public's perception of their products. Science can be manipulated to serve certain agendas. All you can do is practice suspended disbelief. This is the agency that's supposed to be protecting the environment, saying, we know that these chemicals are bad, we know that the companies lie about it, there's nothing we can do. This is in their writing, this is not my opinion. I want to tell you what else showed up in those handwritten notes that got turned over to the courts. These notes here were privileged and confidential. This is in 2002. They're talking about TBA, terbutalazine. They wrote, may be a bit more potent than atrazine. So one, they're admitting that atrazine does something. But they said terbutalazine may be a bit more potent than atrazine. Lower doses cause same effects. This is a company. They go on to write increases in mammary tumors, increases in testicular tumors. This is atrazine. This is 
DBA of terbutalazine. It's one methyl group different. I ain't no chemist, but that's pretty similar. You know what terbutalazine is? It's the chemical that they released in Europe in 2002 after they banned atrazine. So they sat in a room. They said, this chemical is worse than atrazine. Let's give it to Europe. These are people with their own kids and grandkids. I don't understand that. Sagenta wrote, or has on their website, that they assume no obligation to update forward-looking statements to reflect actual results. Forward-looking statements. One who says crap like that. What's more is the EPA wrote that the ultimate decision, they, they, they wrote this, uh, this was a quote from a news article about my work and atrazine. They said the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. It weighs in public opinion. They said the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. It weighs in public opinion. And you know what I thought about when I heard that? I thought about my fancy PNAS paper and I thought, I thought about my mom. The EPA is counting on my mom make an opinion about her health when my work is published in a place that she can't get access to. When my professor says, don't be an advocate, just present the science, but the EPA is counting on somebody to let the public know, to let you know, because they're weighing public opinion. And we do all these things in the ivory tower, get each other tenure and promotions and PhDs, and it's locked away where most of the world doesn't have access. I'm happy to say now recently the EPA has found that atrazine likely harms most species of plants and animals in the U.S. It will hopefully be regulated. California is already listed as a reproductive toxin, which will get it labeled and regulated in California. I could have told them that 20 years ago. And with regards to the statement that I learned, don't be an advocate, let the science speak for itself. I love and respect my Ph.D. professor, but I follow a different philosophy. Now. Two quotes from two of my philosophers, thinkers. One is, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So not only can you be an advocate and a scientist, if you have that privilege, I may not have grown up privilege, but I've been to some fancy schools, I have a duty. This guy said that, by the way. The second great thinker said, it's time for us as a people to start making some changes. Let's change the way we eat. Let's change the way we live. Let's change the way we treat each other. You see, the old way wasn't working, so it's on us to do what we got to do to survive. This guy said that. Died 15 years ago. Rest in peace, Tupac. for a couple of questions. We have microphones down at the front, probably no more than two or three, but if somebody really needs to ask a question, now's your, your chance to do it. So come on down. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very engaging talk. As an environmental ethicist, and the son of an endocrinologist and the husband of a breast cancer survivor, naturally I found it uh, very interesting. So I have a two-part question. Hopefully they can, they're short. Uh, the first one is, to what extent has this been used in tort law to try to um, get some justice for individuals who have been harmed by, um, by, by these chemicals? Uh, but uh, second, how do I filter this crap out of my drink water? <laughs> uh, the first question is, the $100 million lawsuit was settled out of court, and it was originally citizens suing water companies, and then they exchanged that for water companies suing uh, Syngenta to get atrazine out of the water so that it wouldn't get to their customers. Because even if Syngenta sells it and the farmers use it, if it ends up in your water, the water company's liable. It's a weird law, but you can imagine the power that the pest chemical companies have to make that the case. 
Um, I don't want to say a number now, but I know there are a number of lawsuits. I know there's one from a gastrothesis cluster. I know there was a lawsuit from the prost uh, prostate cancer from the workers in the factory. Um, and and I, I was involved in the other lawsuit in that I only helped the lawyer understand the science to, to make the case. Um, the, the second question, which I, I dislike, I'll tell you why, <laughs> is if you look at Brita filter, it actually even says on the side, removes the contaminant atrazine. And I say I don't like it because, man, if I cut a deal back then, I, you know, just one dime for every Brita filter that I sell. But I get no money for saying that. Any carbon filter will take it out. But the other reasons I, the other things I point out is that it doesn't solve the environmental problem in the wildlife, and it also doesn't pro solve the problem for the people who are most affected, because those high levels in farm workers and factory workers are from inhalation and from absorption across the skin, not from drinking. So even if they had access to the information and the money, filtering out the water wouldn't necessarily help the people that are most impacted. Thank you very much. Right, the only thing that can help is to get the stuff out of here and stop its use. Um, I, I, uh, I was interested in your connection with the uh, political arena and uh, how important that is to uh, the uh, control uh, or the appointment of the people who control EPA and uh, FDA. Um, would you comment on the current uh, political candidates for president? And uh, of course, I'm advocating that the only candidate uh, to, uh, to promote our cause here, it would be Dr. Jill Stein. And she's made war on FDA mm -hmm. and EPA uh, because of their uh, corruption, uh, their corrupted uh, policies. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've worked with both local uh, legislators in, in New York, Hawaii, um, Minnesota, and as well as people in U.S. Congress, there's a bill, I think, that's still sitting in Congress to ban the triazines that Keith Ellison wrote. So I've worked in that arena. Um, the first thing that the Obama's appointment to the EPA did was to reopen the case to review atrazine. So I like to think that I had something to do with that. The problem is, and you're right, it's a, the head of the EPA is a presidential appointee. The problem is, if you think of it, and I'm not one to talk about conspiracy theories too much, but if you think about our economy being an agriculture-based economy and that agriculture being controlled by chemical companies, they have a big influence over the over politics. And you know, if you think about where the first presidential caucus is, Iowa, you ain't gonna run for president and go to Iowa and say, oh, I'm gonna work to ban this chemical that's used in the corn that's responsible for your economy. So the ties between politics and economics and the, and the chemical companies and legislation are, are very difficult. In terms of the current presidential candidates, to be honest, I, I think it's a tough call on who would be the best on the, on the, on the environment. So I, I don't want to. I don't want to pick one or the other. <laughs> Others. Um, I thought your slide looking at the frogs you collect on the road trip back and forth in Congress was really interesting. Uh, I'm an obstetrician. I didn't know if, to your knowledge, anybody had looked at atrazine levels in amniotic fluid in human pregnancies in the areas of high blues. So as I showed, there are a bunch of studies that are looking at birth defects the gastrothesis, the coinal atresia, the genital malformations. As I recall, all of those, it's, they didn't measure from the amniotic fluid. I think all of them were based on measurements in, in um, atrazine contamination in the water at, at the places where they did the epidemiological studies. I don't think that any of those studies measured actually atrazine contamination in the mother of the fetus. I, I, I have to double check, but I'm almost sure. I think uh, your, your presentation is wrong. Um, I have two questions, although they may be similar. So would you say that you uh, experienced cases where like um, certain quote unquote credible sources um, conflicting with each other's uh, findings? And then I, and then I followed by that. Um, to, would you say that like certain companies or certain uh, places of high uh, shut down whatever uh, findings that are given. Yes, very much so. I've, I mean, I've seen this happen to, for example, my colleague Fred from Saul, who studies bisphenol A. I've seen him and, and many others be attacked in the same way that I was. Remember, the, the difference with me is I started out working with the company. And so their initial, I'll try to make this story short, their initial 
response that they already knew. I mean, I now know from their notes that they knew atrazine was bad already, but the reason that they hire me and other scientists is then they keep control of the data. So they limit it when and where I could publish, it actually weren't allowing me to publish. And then when I left the contract, because I guess they still thought like that I was like my grandmother's grandfather, that they could just purchase me. But when I left the contract and said, no, I don't, you know, I don't want your money, I'll find it elsewhere. Then they hired other scientists to quote unquote do studies that show that I did some flaw, you know, but, and even the studies that they hired found the same effects that I found, and they just put a different spin on it, and the only studies that have ever claimed that atrazine didn't do anything were the studies from people that they hired. The next level around is they tried to get my papers retracted, they tried to get me fired from university, and then the next level is they actually made threats of physical violence to me quite often, to me and my wife and my daughter, as well as if you look through their notes, you'll see that they tried to purchase my name on the internet, they were in and out of my emails, and all kinds of things. So like, would you say like, um, is it possible for them to, to try to actually like make somebody say something in their favor? Like maybe oh, sure. persuade you like, oh, if I give you money or something like that. Because I've seen such cases like maybe on, uh, on a movie that we're going to see called The Concussion. Um, oh yeah, sure. Like, yeah, they come to somebody and to tell them, you know, say this, you know, when, when you're being telling the public, say this. So, so those documents, those documents from their meetings, okay, those are now public. You, there's a website you can go to and see all of their documents that were released during that court hearing. And those documents, they wrote papers and then they paid other scientists, for example, the guy at the University of Chicago to put his name on it. And they wrote and instructed even EPA. So if you Google my name and you see all the stuff, you'll see this, this quote from an EPA person named Ann Lindsay who said, oh, she, the EPA never saw my data. If you look through their notes, you'll see that they wrote that statement and made sure that she was going to give it. So they even had people from the EPA. I don't, I don't know if she was paid or how they got her to do it, but it, again, this is not just me talking about conspiracy. They wrote it down. It's in the same kind of notes that I just showed you. And, and there are other people that they paid to say things and to write things. Absolutely. We are going to have to stop. But the person with the final question can come down and talk to the doctor. Uh, hey, that would be just great. Uh, but we need to close the session because I know we need to get to our second session, the executive sessions. Please stay here for Dr. Lederman and come down and sit in the front. Those of you who are going to see Dr. Sharon Deem, uh, head to the Sculpture Lecture Hall. And we'll get started in about 10 minutes. Thank you all very much. Wow, what a beginning. Glad I could do it. I'm going to here anybody here's a student. <laughs> Students like teach English. I talk, actually teach environmental education. We talk a lot about you know, how much you've got to bring in the person. Are, we're not going to be able to change people's parts of their minds. Well, you know what the difference I've heard on early on design? If I, when I grew up, I was always, don't bring more people. Yeah. And I was like, wait, I'm not one person. For me, incorporating all the, you know, I used to teach not the contaminant. Oh yeah, I guess you do have to take everything apart, don't you? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This is thank you. Wonderful. Is that your power bank? <laughs> yeah.
You got it? Yeah. All right. All right, are you just plugging in? Awesome. Yep. That's better for me. 